So anyway, welcome to Paper Cuts. Uh, let's begin in on the Phantom of the Opera by Gaston Leroux. Prologue, in which the author of this singular work informs the reader how he acquired the certainty that the opera ghost really existed. The opera ghost really existed. He wasn't, as was long believed, a creature of the imagination of the artists, the superstition of the managers, or a product of the absurd and impressionable brains of the young ladies of the ballet, their mothers, the box keepers, the cloakroom attendants, or the concierge. Sorry, we're gonna pause for a moment. Sorry, I had to pause the recording. Uh, my dear sweet boy Frank, it's raining, he don't like it. I was gonna try and have him in here. But that's not the case. That's not what's happening. Anyway. He wasn't a product of the absurd and impressionable brains of the young ladies of the ballet, their mothers, the box keepers, the cloakroom attendants, or the concierge. Yes, he existed in flesh and blood, although he assumed the complete appearance of a real phantom. That is to say, of a spectral shade. When I began to ransack the archives of the National Academy of Music, I was at once struck by the surprising coincidences between the phenomena ascribed to the ghost and that, and the most extraordinary and fantastic tragedy that ever excited the Paris upper classes. I soon conceived the idea that this tragedy might be reasonably explained by the phenomena in question. The events don't date more than thirty years back, and it wouldn't be difficult to find at the present day in the foyer of the ballet old men of the highest respectability. Men upon whose word one could absolutely rely, who would remember as though they happened yesterday the mysterious and dramatic conditions that attended the kidnapping of Christine Day, the disappearance of the Vicomte de Charnay, and the death of his older brother, Count Philippe, whose body was found on the bank of the lake that exists in the lower cellars of the opera on the Rue Scribe side. But none of these witnesses had until that day thought that there was any reason for connecting the more or less legendary figure of the Opera House ghost with that terrible story. The truth was slow to enter my mind, puzzled by an inquiry that, at every moment, was complicated by events which, at first sight, might be looked upon as superhuman. And more than once I was within an ace of abandoning, 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 why did I have trouble with that? And more than once I was within an ace of abandoning a task in which I was exhausting myself in the hopeless pursuit of a vain image. At last I had received the proof that my presentiments had not deceived me, and I was rewarded for all my efforts on the day when I acquired the certainty that the opera ghost was more than a mere shade. On that day I had spent long hours over the memoirs of a manager, the light and frivolous work of the all-too-skeptical Moncharmin, who, during his term at the opera, understood nothing of all the mysterious behavior of the ghost, and who was making all the fun of it that he could at the very moment, when he became the first victim of the curious financial operation that went on inside the magic envelope. I had just left the library in despair when I met the delightful acting manager of our National Academy, who stood chatting on a landing with a lively and well-groomed little old man, to whom he introduced me gaily. The acting manager knew all about my investigations and how eagerly and unsuccessfully I had been trying to discover the whereabouts of the examining magistrate in the famous Chagny case, M. Fourar. Nobody knew what became of him, alive or dead, and here he was, back from Canada, where he'd spent fifteen years, and the first thing he'd done on his return to Paris was to come to the secretarial offices at the opera and ask for a free seat. The little old man was M. Frar himself. We spent a good part of the evening together, and he told me the whole Chanet case, as he understood it at the time. Also, uh, apologies early on for if I mispronounce names. It's been many years since I've seen Phantom, <laughs> so I don't remember exactly how all the names go. <laughs> anyway. He was bound to conclude in the favor of the madness of the Viscount and the accidental death of the elder bro brother, for lack of evidence to the contrary, but he was nevertheless persuaded that a terrible tragedy had taken place between the two brothers in connection with Christine Day. He couldn't tell me what became of Christine of the Viscount. When I mentioned the ghost, he only laughed. He too had been told the curious manifestations 
that seemed to point to the existence of an abnormal being residing in one of the most mysterious corners of the opera. And he knew the story of the envelope, but he'd never seen it anything, or he'd ne but he'd never seen anything in it worthy of his attention as a magistrate in charge of the Chanet case. And it was as much as he had done to listen to the evidence of the witness, who had appeared of his own accord, and declared that he had often met the ghost. This witness was none other than the man whom all Paris called the Persian, and who was well known to every subscriber to the opera. The magistrate took him for a visionary. I was immensely interested by this story of the Persian. I wanted, if there were still time, to find this valuable and eccentric witness. My luck began to improve, and I discovered him in his little flat in the Rue de Rivoli, where he had lived ever since, and where he had died five months after my visit. I was at first inclined to be suspicious, but when the Persian had told me with childlike candor all that he knew about the ghost, and he had handed me the proofs of the ghost's existence, including the strange correspondence of Christine Day, to do I was pleased with, or to do as I pleased with, I was no longer able to doubt. The ghost was no mere myth. I have, I know, been told that this correspondence may have been forged from first to last by a man whose imagination had certainly been fed on the most seductive tales, but fortunately I discovered some of Christine's writing outside the famous bundle of letters, and on a comparison between the two, all my doubts were removed. I also went into the past history of the Persian and found that he was an upright man incapable of inventing such a story that might have defeated the ends of justice. This, moreover, was the opinion of a more serious people who, at one time or other, were mixed up in the Chanet case, who were friends of the Chanet family, to whom I showed all my documents and set forth all my inferences. In this connection I should like to print a few lines which I received from General... and then the names redacted... Sir... I cannot urge you too strongly to publish the results of your inquiry. I remember perfectly that a few weeks before the disappearance of the great singer Christine Day, and the tragedy which threw the whole of Faubourg St. Germain into mourning, there was a great deal of talk in the foyer of the ballet on the subject of the ghost. And I believe that it only ceased to be discussed in the consequence of the later affair that excited us all so greatly. But if it be possible, as after hearing you, I believe, to explain the tragedy through the ghost, then I beg you, sir, to talk to us about the ghost again. Mysterious though the ghost it may at first appear, he will always be more easily explained than the dismal story in which malevolent people have tried to picture two brothers killing each other who had worshipped each other all their lives. Believe me, etc. Lastly, with my bundle of papers in hand, I once more went over the ghost's vast domain the huge building which he had made his kingdom. All my eyes saw, all that my eyes, all that my mind perceived, corroborated the Persian's documents precisely, and a wonderful discovery crowned my labors in a very definite fashion. It will be remembered that later, when digging in the substructure of the opera, before burying the phonographic records of the artist's voice, the workman laid bare a corpse. Well, I was at once able to prove that this corpse was that of the opera ghost. I made the acting manager put this proof to the test with his own hand, and it is now a matter of supreme indifference to me if the papers pretend that the body was that of a victim of the commune. The wretches who were massacred under the commune in the cellars of the opera were not buried on this side. I will tell where the skeletons can be found in a spot, not very far from that immense crypt, which was stocked during the siege with all sorts of provisions. I came upon this track just when I was looking for the remains of the opera ghost, which I should never have discovered but for the unheard-of chance described above. But we will return to the corpse and what ought to be done with it. For the present I must conclude this very necessary introduction by thanking M. Mifroid, who was the commissary of police called in for the first investigations after the disappearance of Christine Day. M. Remy, the late secretary... M. Mer M. Mercier, the acting manager, M. Gabriel, the late chorus master, and more particularly... Oh, those M's are, monsieur. Uh, mm, let me do that again. For the present, I must conclude this very necessary introduction by thanking Monsieur Mifroid, who was the commissary of police called in for the first investigations after the disappearance of Christine Day, 
Monsieur Remy, the late secretary, Monsieur Mercier, the late acting manager, Monsieur Gabriel, the late chorus master, and, more particularly, Madame le, Madame le Baron de Castel Castelot de Barbaza, who was once the little Meg of the story, and who is not ashamed of it. The most charming star of our admirable corps de ballet. Ballet? <laughs> Gosh dang. I'm getting dumped on by all these French words. The most charming star of our admirable corps de, ba de ballet. The eldest daughter of the worthy Madame Guiret Guiri, now deceased, who had charge of the ghost's private box. All these were of the greatest assistance to me, and thanks to them I shall be able to reproduce those hours of sheer love and terror in their smallest details before the reader's eyes. And I should be ungrateful indeed if I omitted, while standing on the threshold of this dreadful and voracious story, to thank the present management of the opera, who has so kindly assisted me in all my inquiries, and Monsieur Massanger in particular, together with Monsieur Gabion, the acting manager, and that most amiable of men, the architect entrusted with the preservation of the building, who didn't hesitate to lend me the works of Charles Garnier, although he was almost sure that I'd never return them to them. Lastly, I must pay a public tribute to the generosity of my friend and former collaborator, Monsieur J. Le Croze, who allowed me to dip into his splendid theatrical library and to borrow the rarest editions of books, by which he set great store. Signed, Gaston Leroux. Now that we've completed the prologue, let's get right into Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Is it the ghost? It was on the evening. It was the evening on which Messieurs de Bien and Poligny, the managers of the opera, were giving a last gala performance to mark their retirement. Suddenly, the dressing room of La Sorielli, one of the principal dancers, was invaded by half a dozen young ladies of the ballet, who had come up from the stage after dancing Pol <clears throat> One of the principal dancers was invaded. That's a terrible place to start. Who had come up from the stage after dancing Polyukti? They rushed in amid great confusion. Some giving vent to forced and unnatural laughter, and others cries of terror. Sorelli, who wished to be alone for the moment to run through the speech which she was to make to the resigning managers, looked around angrily at the mad and tumultuous crowd. It was little Jams. The girl with the tip-tilted nose, the forget-me-not eyes, the rose-red cheeks, and the lily-white neck and shoulders, who gave the explanation in a trembling voice. It's the ghost! And she locked the door. Sorella's dressing room, Sorelli's rather, Sorelli's dressing room was filled up, was fitted up with an official commonplace elegance. A pier glass, a sofa, a dressing table, and a cupboard or two provided the necessary furniture. On the walls hung a few engravings, relics of the mother who had known the glories of the old opera in the Rue de Pelletier, portraits of the Vestries, Gardel, Dupont, Bignotti. But the room seemed a palace to the brats of the Corps de Ballet, who were lodged in common dressing rooms, where they spent their time singing, quarreling, smacking the dressers and hairdressers, and buying one another glasses of cassis, beer, or even rum. I think that's supposed to be rum. Uh, or buying one another cassis, beer, or even rum until the call bell rang. Sorelli was very superstitious. She shuddered when she heard little Jamais speak of the ghost, called her a silly little fool, and then, as she was the first to believe in ghosts in general, and the opera ghost in particular, at once asked for details. Have you seen him? As plainly as I see you now, said little Jamais, who whose legs were giving way beneath her, and she dropped with a groan into her chair. Thereupon little Geary, the girls with eyes black as sloes, hair black as ink, a swarthy complexion, and a poor little skin stretched over poor little bones, little Geary added, If it's if that's the ghost, he's very ugly. Boo, yes, cried the chorus of ballet girls. And they all began to talk together. The ghost had appeared to them in the shape of a gentleman, in dress clothes who had suddenly stood before them in the passage, without their knowing where he came from. He seemed to have come straight through the wall. Purr, said one of them, who had more or less kept her head. You see the ghosts everywhere. 
and it was true. For several months there had been nothing discussed at the opera, but this ghost in dress clothes who stalked about the building from top to bottom like a shadow, who spoke to nobody, to whom nobody dared speak, and who vanished as soon as he was seen, knowing no one knowing how or where. As he became a real ghost, he made no as became a real ghost, he made no noise in walking. People began by laughing and making fun of this specter, dressed like a man of fashion, or perhaps an undertaker, but the ghost legend soon swelled to enormous proportions among the corps de ballet. All the girls pretended to have met the supernatural being more or less often, and that those and those who laughed the loudest were not the most at ease. When he didn't show himself he betrayed his presence or his passing by accident, comic or serious, for which the general superstition held him responsible. Had anyone met with a fall, or suffered a, pra a practical joke at the hands of one of the other girls, or lost a powder puff, it was at once the fall to the ghost of the opera ghost. After all, who had seen him? You meet so many men in dress clothes at the opera who aren't ghosts, but this dress suit had a peculiarity of its own. It covered a skeleton, at least so the ballet girls said. And of course it had a death's head. Was all this serious? The truth is that the idea of the skeleton came from the description of the ghost given by Joseph Bouquet, the, sh the chief scene shifter, who'd really seen the ghost. He'd run up against the ghost on a little staircase by the footlights, which leads to the cellars. He'd seen him for a second, for the ghost had fled. And to anyone who cared to listen to him, he said, He's extraordinarily thin, and his dress coat hangs on a skeleton frame. His eyes are so deep you can hardly see the fixed pupils. You just see two big black holes as in a dead man's skull. His skin, which is stretched across his bones like a drumhead, is in white but a nasty yellow. His nose is so little worth talking about you can't see its side face. And the absence of that nose, it's a terrible thing to look at. All the hair he has is three or four long dark locks on his forehead and behind his ears. This chief scene shifter was a serious, sober, steady man, very slow at imagining things. His words were received with interest and amazement, and soon there were other people to say that they, too, had met a man in dress clothes with a death's head on his shoulders. Sensible men who had wind of the story began by saying Joseph Bouquet had been the victim of a joke played by one of his assistants, and then one after the other there came a series of incidents so curious and so inexplicable that the very shrewdest people began to feel uneasy. For instance, a fireman is a brave fellow. He fears nothing, least of all fire. While well, the fireman in question, who had gone to make a round of inspection in the cellars, and who, it seemed, had ventured a little farther than usual, suddenly reappeared on the stage, pale, scared, and trembling, with his eyes staring out of his head, and he practically fainted in the arms of the proud mother, the little Jamais. And why? because he'd seen coming toward him, at the level of his head, a head, but without a body attached to it, a head of fire. And as I said, a fireman is not afraid of fire. The fireman's name was Pampin. The corps, the corps de ballet, was flung into consternation. At first sight, this fiery head in no way corresponded with Joseph Bouquet's description of the ghost, but the young ladies soon persuaded themselves that the ghost had several heads which he changed about as he pleased. And, of course, they at once imagined that they were in the greatest danger. Once a fireman didn't hesitate to faint, faint well, leaders in front row and back row girls alike had plenty of excuses for the fright that made them quicken their pace when passing some dark corner or ill-lighted corridor. Sorelli herself, on the day after the adventure of the fireman, placed a horseshoe on the table in front of the stage doorkeeper's box which everyone who entered the opera otherwise than as a spectator must touch before setting foot on the first tread of the staircase. This horseshoe wasn't invented by me any more than any other part of the story. It may still be seen on the table, in the passage outside the stagekeeper's box. When you enter the opera through the court known as the Cour de l'Administration. To return to the evening in question, however, It's the ghost! little Jamses cried. An agonizing silence now reigned in the dressing room. Nothing was heard but the hard breathing of the girls. At last, Jamais, flinging herself upon the farthest corner of the wall, with every mark of real terror on her face, whispered, Listen. 
Everybody seemed to hear a rustling outside the door. There was no sound of footsteps. It was like light silk sliding over the panel. And then it stopped. Sorelli tried to show more pluck than the others, and she went up to the door and in a quavering voice asked, Who's there? But nobody answered. Then feeling all eyes upon her, watching her last movement, she made an effort to show courage and said, very loudly, Is there anyone beside the door? Behind the door, rather. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, of course there is, cried that little dried plum of Meg Geary, heroically holding Sorelli back by her gauze skirt. Whatever you do, don't open that door. Oh, good heavens, don't open the door. But Sorelli, armed with a dagger that never left her, turned the key and threw back the door while the ballet girls retreated to the inner dressing room. And Meg Geary sighed, Mother, mother. Sorelli looked in the passage bravely. It was empty. A, a gas flame in its glass prison cast a red and suspicious light into the surrounding darkness without succeeding in dispelling it. And the dancer slammed the door again with a deep sigh. No, there is no one there. Still we saw him. Jamay declared, returning with timid little steps to her place beside Sorelli. He must be somewhere prowling about. I shan't go back to dress. We'd all better go down to the foyer together at once for the speech, and we'll come up again together. And the child reverently touched the little coral finger ring, which she wore as a charm. <sighs> oh, sorry about that. Mm. And the child reverently touched the little coral finger ring, which she wore as a charm against bad luck, while Sorelli stealthily with the tip of her pink right thumbnail, made a St. Andrew's cross on the wooden ring which adorned the fourth finger of her left hand. She said to the little ballet girls, Come, children, pull yourselves together. I dare say no one has ever seen the ghost. Yes, we saw him. We, yes, we, we saw him just now. He had his death's head in his dress coat just as he looked when he appeared to Joseph Bouquet. And Gabriel saw him too, said Jamais. Oh, only yesterday, yesterday afternoon in broad daylight. G Gabriel, the chorus master? Yes, didn't you know? And he was wearing his dress clothes in broad daylight. Who, Gabriel? N no, the ghost. Certainly, Gabriel told me so himself. That's what he knew him by. Gabriel was in the stage manager's office. Suddenly door the door opened and the Persian entered. You know the Persian has the evil eye. Answered the little ballet girls in chorus, warding off ill luck by pointing their forefinger and little finger at the absent Persian, while their second and third fingers were bent on the palm, and held down by the thumb. And you, and you know how superstitious Gabriel is. However, he's always polite. When he meets the Persian, he just puts his hand in his pocket and touches his keys. Well, the moment the Persian appeared in the doorway, Gabriel went, gave one jump from his chair to the lock of the cupboard, so as to touch iron. In doing so, he tore a whole skirt of his overcoat on a nail. He hurried to get out of the room and banged his forehead against a hat peg and gave himself a huge bump. And then he stepped back and skinned his arm on the screen near the piano. He tried to lean on the piano, but the lid fell on his hands and crushed his fingers. He rushed out of the office like a madman, slipped on the staircase, and came down the whole of the first flight on his back. I was just passing with Mother. We picked him up, and he was covered with bruises, and his face was all over blood. We were frightened of our lives, but at once he began to thank Providence that he got off so cheaply. And then he told us what frightened him. He'd seen the ghost behind the Persian, the ghost with a death head, just like Joseph K's description. Jamais had told her story ever so quickly, as though the ghost was at her heels, and was quite out of breath at the finish. A silence followed, while Sorelli pushed in, polished her nails in great excitement. It was broken by little Geary, who said, Joseph Fouchet, would you better to hold his tongue? Why should he hold his tongue? asked somebody. That's mother's opinion, replied Meg, lowering her voice and looking all about her, as though she was fearing other ears than those present might overhear. And why is it your mother's opinion? Mm, hush. Mother says the ghost doesn't like being talked about. And, and why does your mother say so? Because... Because nothing. This reticence exasperated the curiosity of the young ladies who crowded round little Geary, begging her to explain herself. They were there, side by side, leaning forward simultaneously. 
in one moment of entreaty and fear, communicating their terror to one another, taking a keen pleasure in feeling their blood freeze in their veins. I swore not to tell. But they left her no peace, and promised to keep the secret until Meg, burning to say all she knew, began with her eyes fixed on the door. Well, it's because of the private box. One private box? The ghost box? Has the ghost a box? Oh, tell us, tell us, tell us. Not so loud. It's box five, you know, the box on the grand tier next to the stage box on the left. Oh, nonsense. I tell you, it, it is. Mother has charge of it. But you swear you won't say a word? Of course, of course. Well, that's the ghost's box. No one has had it for over a month except the ghost, and orders have been given at the box office that it must never be sold. And the ghost really does come there? Yes. Then somebody does come. Why, no, the ghost comes, but there's nobody there. The little ballet girls exchanged glances. If the ghost came to the box, he must be seen, because he wore a dress coat and a death's head. This was what they m tried to make Meg understand, but she replied, That's just it. The ghost is not seen, and he has no dress coat and no head. All that talk about his death's head and his head of fire is nonsense. There's nothing in it. You only hear him when he's in the box. Mother's never seen him, but she's heard him. Mother knows because she gives him his program. Sorelli interfered at this. Geary, child, you're getting at us. Thereupon, little Geary began to cry. I ought to have held my tongue if Mother ever came to know. But I was quite right. Joseph Bouquet had no business to talk of things that don't concern him. It'll bring him bad luck. Mother was saying so last night. There was a sound of hurried and heavy footsteps in the passage, and a breathless voice cried, Cecile, Cecile, are you there? It's Mother's voice. What's the matter? She opened the door, and a respectable lady built on the lines of a Pomeran built on the lines of a Pomeranian grenadier, burst into the dressing room and dropped groaning into a vacant armchair. Her eyes rolled madly in her brick dust colored face. How awful, how awful. What? Joseph Bouquet. What about him? Joseph Bouquet is dead. The room became filled with exclamations, with, with astonished outcries, with scared requests for explanations. Yes, he was found hanging in the third floor cellar. It's the ghost, little Geary blurted, as though in spite of herself, but at once she corrected herself with her hands pressed to her mouth. No, 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 I didn't say it. I didn't say it. All around her, her panic-stricken companions repeated under their breaths. Yes, it must be the ghost. Sorelli was very pale at this. I shall never be able to recite my speech, she said. Madame Jamais gave her opinion while she emptied a glass of liqueur that happened to be standing on a table. <laughs> the ghost must have had something to do with it. The truth is that no one ever knew how Joseph Bouquet met his death. The verdict at the inquest was natural suicide, and in his, mem in his memoirs of manager, Monsieur Marchemin, one of the joint managers who succeeded Messieurs de Bien and Poligny, describes the incident as follows. A grievous accident spoiled the little party with Messieurs de Bien and Poligny gave to celebrate their retirement. I was in the manager's office when Mercier, the acting manager, suddenly came darting in. He seemed half mad, and told me that the body of a scene shifter had been found hanging in the third cellar under the stage, between a farmhouse and a scene from the Roy de Lahore. I shouted, Come and cut him down! and by the time I had rushed down the staircase in the Jacob's Ladder, the man was no longer hanging from his rope. <laughs> so this is an event which Monsieur Montchermain thinks is natural. A man hangs to the end of the rope, they go to cut him down, and the rope has disappeared. Oh, Monsieur Montchermain found a very simple explanation. Listen to him. It was just after the ballet, and the leaders and
Okay. Good heavens, that was uh, an adventure. Uh, I'm going to type something in chat. But essentially, uh, my laptop just lost power for a few moments there. It was the Opera Ghost. Woo! <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, the Opera Ghost meddling aside. Let's return to the... Uh, let's return to the book. Where, we were, where were we? Um, so this is an event in which Monsieur Marchamain thinks natural. A man hangs at the end of a rope. They go to cut him down, and the rope has disappeared. Oh, Monsieur Montcharmain found a very simple explanation, mind. Listen to him. It was just after the ballet, and leaders and dancing girls take lost no times in taking their precautions against the evil eye. There you are. Picture the corps de ballet, scuttling down the Jacob's Ladder and, def and dividing the suicide's rope among themselves in less time than it takes to write. When, on the other hand, I think of the exact spot where the body was discovered, the third cellar underneath the stage, imagine that somebody must have been interested in seeing that the rope disappeared after it had effected its purpose, and time will show if I'm wrong. The horrid news soon spread all over the opera, where Joseph Bouquet was very popular. The dressing rooms emptied, and the ballet girls crowding around Sorelli like timid sheep around their shepherdess, made for the foyer through the ill-lit passages and staircases, trotting as fast as their little pink legs would carry them. Chapter 2. The New Margarita On the first landing, Sorelli ran against the Comte de, Ca Comte de Chanet, who was coming upstairs. The Count, who was generally so calm, seemed greatly excited. I was just going to you, he said, taking off his hat. Oh, Sorelli, what an evening! And Christine Day, what a triumph! Impossible, said Meg Geary. Six months ago she used to seem like a crock. But do let us get by, my dear Count, continued the brat, with a saucy curtsy. We're going to inquire after a poor man who was found hanging by the neck. And just then the acting manager came fussing past and stopped when he heard this remark. What? Have you girls heard? Already? Well, please forget about it for tonight. And above all, don't let Miss, don't let Monsieur Dimsen and Mr. Monsieur Pelini hear. It would upset them too much on their last day. They all went on to the foyer. Fo foy foyer. <laughs> they all went on to the foyer. I guess foyer would be a valid pronunciation. This is French. They all went on to the foyer of the ballet, which was already full of people. The Comte de Chanet was, right, was right. No gala performance had ever equaled this one. All the great composers of the day had conducted their own works in turns. Faure and Kraus had sung, and on that evening Christine Day had revealed her true self for the first time to the astonished and enth enthusiastic audience. Gonard had conducted the funeral march of a marionette, rare his beautiful overture to Siguar, Saint Saint's the Danse Macabre and Reverie Orientale, Masnet, an unpublished Hungarian march, Girard, his carnival, De Blaise, the Vals Lent from Sylvia, and the Pizzicati from Coppelia. Kraus had sung the Bolero and the Vespi Sil Silicani, and De Denise Bloch, the drinking song, and Lucrezia Borgia. Good heavens, those were a lot of names. Ooh, sorry, I bumped the microphone. <laughs> But the real triumph was reserved for Christine Day, who had begun by singing a few passages from Romeo and Juliet. It was the first time that the young artist sang in this work of Gounod, which had not been transferred to the opera and which was revived at the Opera Comique after it had been produced at the old theatre lyric by Madame Carvalho. Those who heard her say that her, ugh, those who heard her say that her voice in these passages was seraphic. But this was nothing to the superhuman notes she gave forth in the prison scene the file and but this was nothing to the superhuman notes she gave forth in the prison scene in the final trio in Faust, which she sang in the place of La Carlotta, who was ill 
No one had ever heard or seen anything like it. Day revealed a new margarita that night, a margarita of splendor, a radiance hitherto unsuspected. The whole house went mad, rising to its feet, shouting, cheering, clapping, while Christine sobbed and fainted in the arms of her fellow singers and had to be carried to her dressing room. A few subscribers, however, protested. Why had so great a treasure been kept from all that time? Till then, Christine Day had played a good Siebel's Carlotta's rather too splendidly material margarita, and it had been in and it had needed Carlotta's incomprehensible and inexcusable absence from this gala night, with little day at a moment's warning to show all that she could do in a part of the program reserved for the Spanish diva. Well, what the subscribers wanted to know was, why had Debienne and Poligny applied to day when Carlotta had taken ill? Did they know of her hidden genius? And if they knew of it, why had they kept it hidden? And why had she kept it hidden? Oddly enough, she was not known to have a professor of singing at the moment. She had often said she meant to practice alone for the future. The whole thing was a mystery. The Comte de Chanet, standing up in his box, listened to all this frenzy and took part in it by loudly applauding. Philippe Georges Marais Comte de Chanet was just forty-one years of age. He was a great aristocrat and a good-looking man above middle height and with attractive features in spite of his hard forehead and rather cold eyes. He was exquisitely polite to the women and a little haughty to the men, who didn't always forgive him for his successes in society. He had, had, he had an excellent heart and an irreproachable conscience. On, de, on the death of old Count Philibert, he became the head of one of the oldest and most distinguished families in France, whose arms dated back to the 14th century. The Chauniers owed a great, owned a great deal of of property, and when the old count, who was a widower, died, it was no easy task for Philippe to accept the management of so large an estate. His two brothers and his sister, Raoul, would not hear of a division and waived their claim to the shares, leaving, them, leaving themselves entirely in Philippe's hands, as though the right of the primogeniture had never ceased to exist. When the two sisters married on the same day, they received their portion from their brother, not as a thing rightfully belonging to them, but as a dowry, for which they thanked him. The Comtesse de Chonet, ne Mirioge, M <laughs> I don't know how to speak French. Uh, the, the Comtesse de Chonet, uh, ne de Marie de la Martiniere, had died in giving birth to Raoul, who was born twenty years after his elder brother. At the time of the old Count's death, Raoul was twelve years of age. Philippe busied himself actively with his youngster's education. He was admirably assisted in his work, first by his sisters and afterward by an old aunt, the widow of a naval officer who lived at Brest and gave young Raoul a taste for the sea. The lad had entered the board a training ship, finished his course with honors, and quietly made his trip round the world. Thanks to a powerful influence, he had just been appointed a member of the official expedition on board the Requin, which was to be sent to the Arctic Circle in search of the survivors of the D'Artois expedition, of whom nothing had been heard for three years. Meanwhile, he was enjoying a long furlough, which would not be over for six months, and already the dowagers of the Faubourg Faub Saint-Germain were pitying the handsome and apparently delicate stripling for the hard work in store for him. The shyness of the sailor lad, I was almost saying his innocence, was remarkable. He seemed to have but just left the women's apron strings. As a matter of fact, petted as he was by his two sisters and his old aunt, he had retained from this purely feminine ed education manners that were almost candid and stamped with a charm that nothing yet had been able to sully. He was little over twenty-one years of age and looked eighteen. He had a small, fair moustache, beautiful blue eyes, and a complexion like a girl's. Philippe spoiled Raoul. To begin with, he was very proud of him and pleased to foresee a glorious career for his junior in the navy in which one of their ancestors, the famous Chonet de la Roche, had held the rank of admiral. He took advantage of the young man's leave of absence to show him Paris, with all its luxurious and artistic delights. The Count considered that, at Raoul's age, it's not good to be too good. Philippe himself had a character that was very well balanced in work and pleasure alike. His demeanor was always faultless, and he was incapable of setting his brother a bad example. He took with him, he took him with him wherever he went, 
even introduced him to the foyer of the ballet. I knew that the Count was said to be on terms with Sorelli, but it could hardly be reckoned as a crime for this nobleman, a bachelor with plenty of leisure, especially since his sisters were settled, to come and spend an hour or two after dinner in the company of a dancer, who, though not so very, very witty, had the finest eyes that were ever seen. And besides, there are places which are where a true Parisian, when he is the rank of Comte de Chenet, anyway, is bound to show himself, and at that time the foyer of the ballet at the opera was one of those places. Lastly, Philippe would perhaps not have taken his brother behind the scenes of the opera if Raoul had not been the first to ask him, repeatedly renewing his request with a gentle obstinacy which the Count remembered at a later date. On that evening, Philippe, after applauding the, de applauding the day, returned to Raoul and saw that he was quite pale. "'Don't you see that woman's fainting?' said Raoul. You look like, rather the Count is a haughty man. You look like fainting yourself. What's the matter? said the Count, but Raoul had recovered himself and was standing up. Let's go and see. Yes, I, um, yes, I like that voice. Let's go and see. She never sang like that before. The Count gave his brother a curious smiling glance and seemed quite pleased. They were soon at the door leading from the house to the stage, and numbers of subscribers were slowly making their way through. Raoul tore his gloves without knowing what he was doing, and Philippe had too kind a heart to laugh at him for his impatience. But he now understood why Raoul was absent-minded when spoken to, and why he had always tried to turn every conversation to the subject of the opera. They had reached the stage and pushed through the chorus of gen the crowd of gentlemen, scene shifters, supers, and chorus girls, Raoul leading the way, feeling that his heart no longer belonged to him, his face set with passion, while Count Philippe followed him with difficulty and continued to smile. At the back of the stage, Raoul had to stop before the inrush of, little tr of the little troop of ballet girls who blocked the passage which he was trying to enter. More than one chafing phrase darted up from little made-up lips, to which he didn't reply and at last he was able to pass, and dove into the semi-darkness of a corridor, ringing with the name of Day. Day. The Count was surprised to find that Raoul knew the way. He'd never taken him to Christine's himself, and came to the conclusion that Raoul must have gone there alone while the Count stayed in the foyer with Sorelli, who often asked him to wait until it was her time to go on, and sometimes handed him the little gaiters, in which she ran down from her dressing-room to preserve the spotlessness of her satin dancing shoes and her flesh-colored tights. So really had an excuse she had lost her mother. Postponing his usual visit to Sorelli for a few minutes, the Count followed his brother down the passage that led to Day's dressing-room and saw that it had never been so crammed as on that evening, when the whole house seemed excited by her success and also by her fainting fit. For the girl had not yet come to, and the doctor of the theater had just arrived at the moment when Raoul entered at his heels. Christine, therefore, received the first aid of one, well, opening her eyes in the arms of the other. The Count and so many more remained crowding in the doorway. "'Don't you think, Doctor, that those gentlemen had better clear the room? There's no breathing here.' "'You're quite right,' said the Doctor, and he sent everyone away except Raoul and the maid, who looked at Raoul with the eyes of most undisguised astonishment. She'd never seen him before, and dared not to question him. And the doctor imagined that the young man was only acting as he did because he had the right to. The Viscount, therefore, remained in the room watching Christine as she slowly returned to life, while even the joint managers, Debian and Poligny, who had come to offer their sympathy and congratulations, found themselves thrust into the passage among the crowd of dandies. The Count... The Comte de Chenet, who was one of those standing outside, laughed. Oh, 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 the rogue! And he added under his breath, Those youngsters with their schoolgirl airs. So he's a Chenet after all. He turned to go to Sorelli's dressing room, but met her on the way, with her little troop of trembling ballet girls, as we've seen. Meanwhile, Christine Day uttered a deep sigh, which was answered by a groan. She turned her head, saw Raoul, and started. She looked at the doctor, on whom she bestowed a smile, and then her maid, and then at Raoul again. Monsieur, she said in a voice not much above a whisper, who are you? Mademoiselle, 
replied the young man, kneeling on one knee and presenting a fervent kiss on the diva's hand. I am the little boy who went into the sea to rescue your scarf. Christine again looked at the doctor and the maid, and at this all three began to laugh. Raoul turned very red and stood up. Mademoiselle, since you are pleased not to recognize me, I should like to say something to you in private, something very important. Well, I'm better, do you mind? And her voice shook. You must have been very good. Mm, yes, you must go said the doctor, with his pleasantest smile. Leave me to attend to the mademoiselle. I'm not ill now, said Christine, suddenly, with strange and unexpected energy. She rose and passed her hand over her eyelids. Thank you, doctor. I should like to be alone. Please, go away, all of you. Leave me. I feel very restless this evening. The doctor tried to make a short protest, but... Perceiving the girl's evident agitation, he thought the best remedy was not to thwart her. And so he went away, saying to Raoul outside, mm, She's not herself tonight. She's usually so gentle. And then he said good night, and Raoul was left alone. The whole of this part of the theater was now deserted. The farewell ceremony was no doubt taking place in the foyer of the ballet. Raoul thought the day might go to it, and he waited in silent solitude, even hiding in the favoring shadow of a doorway. He felt a terrible pain at his heart, and it was of this that he wanted to speak to day without delay. Suddenly the dressing-room door opened, and the maid came out by herself, carrying bundles. He stopped her and asked how her mistress was. The woman laughed and said that she was quite well, but that he must not disturb her, for she wished to be left alone. And she passed on. One idea alone filled Raoul's burning brain. Of course Day wished to be left alone for him. Had he not told her that he wanted to speak to her privately? Hardly breathing, he went up to the dressing room and with his ear to the door to catch her reply, prepared to knock, but his hand dropped. He had heard a man's voice in the dressing room saying in a curiously masterful tone, Christine, you must love me. And Christine's voice, infinitely sad and trembling, as though accompanied by tears, replied, How can you talk like that, when I sing only for you? Raoul leaned against the panel to ease his pain. His heart, which had seemed gone forever, returned to his breast and was throbbing loudly. The whole passage echoed with its beating, and Raoul's ears were deafened. Surely, if his heart continued to make such a noise, they would hear it inside, they would open the door, and the young man would be turned away in disgrace. What a position for a shani. To be caught listening behind a door, he took his heart in his two hands to make it stop. The man's voice spoke again. Are you very tired? Oh, tonight I gave you my soul and I'm dead, Christine replied. Your soul is a beautiful thing, child, replied the grave man's voice. And I thank you. No emperor ever received so fair a gift. The angel swept tonight. Raoul heard nothing after that. Nevertheless, he did not go away, but, as though he feared lest he should be caught, he returned to his dark corner, determined to wait for the man to leave the room. At one and the same time he learned what love meant in hatred. He knew that he loved. He wanted to know whom he hated. To his great astonishment, the door opened and Christine Day appeared, wrapped in furs, with her face hidden in a lace veil alone. She closed the door behind her, but Raoul observed that she didn't lock it. She passed him, and he didn't even follow her with his eyes, for his eyes were fixed on the door, which didn't open again. Oh, sorry. When the passage was once more deserted, he crossed it, opened the door of the dressing room, went in and shut the door. He found himself in absolute darkness. The gas had been turned out. There's someone here. Hang on, that's too low for Raoul. There's someone here, said Raoul, with his back against the closed door in a quivering voice. What are you hiding for? All was darkness and silence. Raoul heard only the sound of his own breathing, and he quite failed to see that, in, that the indiscretion of his conduct was exceeding all bounds. You shan't leave this until I let you. If you don't answer, you're a coward, but I'll expose you. 
and at this he struck a match. The blaze lit up the room, but there was no one in the room. Raoul, first turning the key in the door, lit the gas jets. He went into the dressing closet, opened the cupboards, and hunted about. Felt the walls with his moist hands. Nothing. Look here, am I going mad? He stood for ten minutes, listening to the gas flaring in the silence of the empty room. Lover though he was, he didn't even think of stealing a ribbon that would have given him the perfume of the women he loved. He went out, not knowing what he was doing nor where he was going. At a given moment in his wayward progress, an icy draft struck him in the face. He found himself at the bottom of a staircase, down which, behind him, a procession of workmen were carrying a sort of stretcher covered with a white sheet. "'Which is the way out, please?' he asked one of the men. "'Straight in front of the door is open, but let us pass.' Pointing to the stretcher, he asked mechanically, "'What's that? Er, what's that?' the workman answered. "'That's Joseph Piquet, and we found him in the third cellar, hanging between a farmhouse and a scene from the Roy de Lor. He took off his hat, fell back to make the room for the procession, and went out. Anyway, Chapter 3 the mysterious reason. During this time, the farewell ceremony was taking place. I had already said that on this ma magnificent function was being given the occasion was being given thanks to the occasion of the retirement of Monsieur Debienne and Monsieur Poligny, who had been determined to die game, as we say nowadays. They had been assisted in their realization of their ideal through, though melancholy, programmed by all that counted in the social and artistic world of Paris. All these people met after the performance in the foyer of the ballet, where Sorelli waited for the arrival of the retiring managers with a glass of champagne in her hand and a little prepared speech at the tip of her tongue. Behind her, the members of the corps de ballet, ballet uh, young and old, discussed the events of the day in whispers or exchanged discreet signals with their friends, a noisy crowd of whom surrounded the supper tables arranged along the slanting floor. A few of the dancers had already changed into ordinary dress, but most of them wore their skirts of gossamer gauze, and all had thought it the right thing to put on a special face for the occasion. All, that is, except little Jamais, whose fifteen summers, happy age, seemed to have already forgotten the ghost and the death of Joseph Bouquet. She never ceased to laugh and chatter, to hop about and pray practical jokes, until Messieurs Debienne and Poligny appeared on the steps of the foyer when she was severely called to order by the impatient Sorelli. Everybody remarked that the retiring managers looked cheerful as is the Paris way. None will ever be a true Ooh, excuse me. None will ever be a true Parisian who has not learned to wear a mask of gaiety over his sorrows and one of sadness, boredom or indifference over his inward joy. You know that one of your friends is in trouble. Do not try to console him. He will tell you that he's already comforted. But should he have met with good fortune, be careful how you congratulate him. He thinks it's so natural that he's surprised you should speak of it. In Paris, our lives are one masked ball, and the foyer of the ballet is the last place in which two men so knowing as Messieurs Debienne and Poligny would have made the mistake of betraying their grief, however genuine it might be and they were already smiling rather too broadly upon Sorelli, who had begun to recite her speech when an exclamation from that little madcap of a jambe broke the smile of the manager so brutally that the expression of distress and dismay that lay beneath it became apparent to all eyes. "'The opera ghost!' Chamay yelled these words in a tone of unspeakable terror, and her finger pointed among the crowd of dandies to a face so pallid, so lugubrious, and so ugly, with two such deep black cavities under the straddling eyebrows that the death's head in question immediately scored a huge success. "'The opera ghost! The opera ghost!' Everybody laughed and pushed his neighbor and wanted to offer the opera ghost a drink, but he was gone. He had slipped through the crowd, and the others vainly hunted for him, while the two old gentlemen tried to calm little Jamais, and while little Geary stood screaming like a peacock. Sorelli was furious. She hadn't been able to finish her speech. The managers had kissed her, thanked her, and run away as fast as the ghost himself. No one was surprised at this, for it was known that they were to go through the same ceremony on the floor above, in the foyer of the singers, and that finally they were themselves to receive their personal friends for the last time in the great lobby outside the manager's office, where a regular supper would be served. Here they found the new managers, 
Monsieur Armand Boncharmain, and Monsieur Firmin Richard. <laughs> Richard. Mm, words are hard. Monsieur Firmin Richard, whom they hardly knew. Nevertheless, they were lavish in protestations of friendship, and received a thousand flattering comments in reply, so that those of the guests who had feared they had rather a rather tedious evening in store for them at once put on brighter faces. The supper was almost gay and a particularly clever approach of the representative of the government, mingling the glories of the past with the successes of the future, and it caused the greatest cordiality to prevail. The retiring managers had already handed over to their successors the two tiny master keys which opened all the doors, thousands of doors, of the opera house, and those little keys the object of general curiosity were being passed from hand to hand when the attention of some of the guests was diverted by the discovery at the end of the table of that strange wan and fantastic face with the hollow eyes which had already appeared in the foyer of the ballet and had been greeted by little Jean Jamais' exclamation of the opera ghost there sat the ghost as natural as could be except he neither ate nor drank those who began by looking at him with a smile, ended by turning away their heads, for the sight of him at once provoked the most funer funereal thoughts. No one repeated the joke of the foyer. No one exclaimed, There's the opera ghost! He, didn't, he himself didn't speak a word, and his very neighbors couldn't have stated at what precise moment he'd sat down between them. But every one of them felt that if the dead ever did come and sit at the table of the livings, they could not cut a more ghastly figure. The friends of Fermin Richard and Armand de Montcharmain thought that this lean and skinny guest was an acquaintance of Debienne or Poligny's, while Debienne's and Poligny's friends believed that the cadaverous individual belonged to Fermin Richard and Armand de Montcharmain's party. The result was that no request was made for an explanation, no unpleasant remark, no joke in bad taste which might have offended this visitor from the tomb. A few of those present who knew the story of the ghost and the description of him given by the chief sheen shifter they didn't know of Joseph Piquet's that death thought in their own minds that the man at the end of the table might have easily passed for him, and yet according to the story the ghost had no nose, and the person in question had. But Monsieur Marcharmain declares in his memoirs that the guest's nose was transparent, long, thin, and transparent are his exact words. I, for my part, will add that this very might well be a false nose. This description could apply to it very well, you see. Monsieur Montcharmain may have taken for transparency what was only shininess. Everyone knows that orthopedic science provides beautiful false noses for those who have lost their noses naturally or as the result of an operation. Did the ghost really take a seat at the manager's supper table that night uninvited? And can we be sure that the figure was that of the opera ghost himself? Who would venture to assert as such? I mention the incident not because I wish for a second to make the reader believe, or even try to make him believe, that the ghost was capable of such a sublime piece of impudence, but because, after all, the thing is impossible. Monsieur Armand Montcharmain, in chapter 11 of his memoir, says... When I think of this first evening, I cannot separate the secret confided to us by Messieurs Davien and Poligny, and their office from, our, from the presence at our supper of that ghostly person whom none of us knew. What happened was this. Messieurs Debienne and Poligny, sitting at the center of the table, had not seen the man with a death's head. Suddenly, he began to speak. Mm -hmm. The ballet girl is all right. The death of that poor Piquet's... Perhaps not so natural as people think. Debienne and Poligny gave a start. Is Bouquet dead? they cried. Yes, replied the man, or the shadow of a man, quietly. He was found this evening, hanging in the third cellar between a farmhouse and a scene from the Roy de Laure. The two managers, or rather ex-managers, at once rose and stared strangely at the speaker. They were more excited than they need have been, that is to say, more excited than any one need be by the announcement of a suicide of a chief scene-shifter. They looked at each other. They had both turned whiter than the tablecloth. At last Debienne made a sign to Messieurs Richard and Montcharmain. Poligny muttered a few words of excuse to the guest, and all four went to the manager's office. 
I leave Monsieur Moncharmain to complete the story, and in his memoirs he says, Messieurs de Bien and Poligny seem to grow more and more excited, and they appear to have something very difficult to tell us. First they asked us if we knew the man sitting at the end of the table, who had told them of the death of the Joseph Bouquet, and when we answered the negative they looked still more concerned. They took the master keys from our hands, stared at them for a moment, and advised us to have, to, to have new locks made, with the greatest secrecy for the rooms, closets, and presses that we might wish to have hermetically closed. They said this so funnily that we began to laugh and ask if there were thieves at the opera, and they replied that there was something worse the ghost. We began to laugh again, feeling sure that they were indulging in some joke that it intended to crown our little entertainment. Then at their request we became serious, resolving to humor them and enter the spirit of the game. They told us that they never would have spoken to us of the ghost if they had not received formal orders from the ghost himself to ask us to be pleasant to him and to grant any request that he might make. However, in their relief at showing a domain, at leaving a domain where that tyrannical shade held sway, they had hesitated until the last moment to tell us this curious story, which our skeptical minds were certainly not prepared to entertain. But the announcement of the death of Joseph Bouquet had served them as a brutal reminder that when, whenever they had disregarded the ghost's wishes, some fantastic or disastrous event had brought them to a sense of their dependence. During these unexpected utterances, made in a tone of the most secret and important confidence, I looked at Richard. Richard, in his student days, had acquired a great reputation for practical joking, and he seemed to relish the dish which was being served up to him in his turn. He didn't miss a morsel of it, though the seasoning was a little gruesome, given the death of Bouquet. He nodded his head sadly. While the other spoke, and his speeches assumed the air of a man who bitterly regretted having taken over the opera, now that he knew there was a ghost mixed up in the business. I could think of nothing better than to give him a servile imitation of this attitude of despair. However, in spite of all our efforts, we could not, at the finish, help bursting out laughing in the faces of Monsieur de Bien and Poligny, who, seeing us pass straight from the gloomiest state of mind to one of the most insolent, insolent merriment, acted as though they thought we had gone mad. The joke had become a little tedious, and Richard asked half seriously and half in jest. "'But what, after all, does this little ghost of yours want?' Monsieur Poligny went to his desk and returned with a copy of his memorandum book. The memorandum book begins with a well-known word saying that the management of the opera shall give to the performance of the National Academy of Music the splendor that becomes the first lyric in the lyric stage in France, and ends with Clause 98, which says that the privilege can be withdrawn if the memoranda, if the manager infringes the conditions stipulated in the memorandum book. This is followed by the conditions which are four in number. The copy produced by Monsieur Peligny was written in black ink, and exactly similar to that in our possession, except at the end it contained a paragraph in red ink and a strange, labored handwriting, as though it had been produced by dipping the heads of matches into the ink, the writing of a child that's never gotten beyond the downstrokes, and has not learned to join its letters. The paragraph ran word for word as it follows. 5. Or if the manager, in any month, delay more than a fortnight the payment of the allowance which he shall make to the opera ghost, an allowance of 20,000 francs a month, say 240,000 francs a year. Monsieur Poligny pointed with a hesitating finger to this last clause, which we certainly didn't expect. Is this not all? Is this all? Does he not want anything else? asked Richard with the greatest coolness. Yes, he does, replied Poligny, and he turned over the pages of the memorandum, until he came to the clause specifying the days on which pr certain private boxes were to be reserved for the free use of the President of the Republic, the ministers, and so on. And at the end of this clause, a line had been added also in this red ink. Box, <clears throat> box five on the grand tier shall be placed at the disposal of the opera ghost for every performance. When we saw this, there was nothing to, else for us to do but to rise from our chairs, shake our two predecessors warmly by the hand, and congratulate them on thinking of this charming little go joke, which proved that the old French sense of humor was never likely to become extinct. Richard added that he now understood why Messieurs de Bien and Poligny were retiring from the management of the National Academy of Music. Business was impossible with so unreasonable a ghost. 
certainly two hundred and forty thousand francs are not to be picked up for are not to be picked up for the asking, said Monsieur Poligny, without moving a muscle of his face. If we consider what the loss over box five meant to us, we didn't sell at once. And not only that, but we had to return the subscription. Why it's awful. We really can't work to keep ghosts. We prefer to go away. Yes, echoed Miss Monsieur Debian. We prefer to go away. Let's go. And he stood up. Richard said, But after all, it seems to me that you were much too kind to the ghost. If I had such a troublesome ghost as that, I shouldn't hesitate to have him arrested. But how? Where? We've never seen him. When he comes to his box. We've never seen him in his box. Then sell it. Sell the opera box. Opera ghost's box. Poor gentlemen, try it. Thereupon we all four left the office. Richard and I had never laughed so much in our lives. All right, folks. Uh, it's been about an hour. So before we start in on the next chapter, I would suggest giving the video one of them there pauses, uh, getting your getting your stretch on, get some get some blood pumping, maybe grab a snack, grab some water. You're gonna need it. <laughs> you know, as usual. Uh, feel free to come back in a moment. When you've gotten all that done. Anyway, let's, uh. Oh, one moment. Four, chapter four, box five. Armand Montcharmain wrote such voluminous memoirs during the fairly long period of his co management that we may well ask if he ever found time to attend to the affairs of the opera, otherwise than by telling what, what went on there. Monsieur Marcharmain did, did not know a note of music, but he called the Minister of Education and Fine Arts by his Christian name, had dabbled a little in society journals, and enjoyed a considerable private income. Lastly, he was a charming fellow, and showed that he wasn't lacking in intelligence, for as soon as he made up his mind to be a sleeping partner in the opera, he selected the best possible active manager, and went straight to Fermin, Richa, Fermin Richard. For me and Richard was a very distinguished composer, who had published a number of successful pieces of all kinds, and who liked nearly every form of music and every sort of musician. Clearly, therefore, it was the duty of every sort of musician to like Monsieur Fermin Richard. The only things to be said against him were that he was rather masterful in his ways and endowed with a very hasty temper. The first few days which the partners spent at the opera were given over to the delight of finding themselves at the head of the so magnificent an enterprise, and they had forgotten all about that curious, fantastic story of the ghost. When an incident occurred that it proved to them that the joke, if joke it were, was not over, Monsieur Fermin reached his office that morning at eleven o'clock, and his secretary, Monsieur Remy, showed him half a dozen letters which he had not opened because they were marked private. One of the letters had at once attracted Richard's attention, not only because the envelope was addressed in red ink, but because he seemed to have seen the writing before. He soon remembered that it was the red handwriting in which the memorandum book had been so curiously completed. He recognized the clumsy, childish hand. He opened the letter and read, Dear Mr. Manager, I am sorry to have to trouble you at a time when you must be so very busy, renewing important engagements, signing fresh ones, and generally displaying your excellent taste. I know what you have done for Carlotta, Sorelli, and Little Jamais, and for a few others whose admirable qualities, qualities of talent or genius you have suspected. Of course, when I use these words, I do not mean to apply them to La Carlotta, who sings like a squirt and who ought never have been allowed to leave the ambassadeurs in the Café Jacquin, nor to La Sorelli, who owes her success mainly to the coach builders, nor to Little Jarmet, who dances like a calf in the field. And I am not speaking of Christine Day either, though her genius is certain. Whereas your jealousy prevents her from creating any important part. When all is said, you're free to conduct your little business as you think best, are you not? All the same, I should like to take advantage of the fact that you have not yet turned Christine Day out of the doors, by hearing her this evening in the part of Seville, as that of Margarita has been forbidden her since her triumph of the other evening. And I will ask you not to dispose of my box today, nor on the following days. 
for I cannot end this letter without telling you how disagreeably surprised I have been at once or twice to hear on arriving at the opera that my box had been sold at the box office by your orders. I did not protest at first, because I dislike scandal, and second, because I thought your predecessors— Messieurs Debian and Poligny, who were always charming to me, had neglected before leaving to mention my little fads to you. I've now received a reply from those gentlemen in my letter, asking for an explanation. And this reply proves that you know all about my memorandum book, and consequently that you are treating me with outrageous contempt. If you wish to live in peace, you must not begin by taking away my private box. Believe me to be, dear Mr. Manager, without prejudice to these little observations, your most humble and obedient servant, Opera Ghost. The letter was accompanied by a cutting from the agony column of the Revue Theatral, which ran, Oh, gee, there's no excuse for R and M. We told them and left your memorandum book in their hands. Kind regards. Monsieur Fermain had hardly finished reading this letter when Monsieur Armand Montcharmain entered, carrying one exactly similar. They looked at each other and burst out laughing. They are keeping up the joke, but I don't call it funny. What does it all mean? Do they imagine that because we've been manage they've been managers of the opera that we are going to let them have a box for an indefinite period? I'm not in the mood to let myself be left that long said Fermain. It's harmless enough, observed Armand. What do they really want, a box for tonight? Monsieur Fermain Richard told his secretary to send box five. On the grand tier to Messieurs Debien and Poligny, if it was not sold. And it was not, it was sent off to them. Debien lived at the corner of the Rue Scribe and the Boulevard des Capuchines. Poligny in the Rue Aubert des Augustes. Poligny in the Rue Bear. Ogos, two letters had been posted at the Boulevard de, Cap de Capuchin's post office, as Montcharmain remarked after examining the envelopes. Mm, you see, said Richard. They shrugged their shoulders and regretted that two men of that age should amuse themselves with such childish tricks. Mm, they might have been a civil for all that, said Montcharmain. Did you notice how they treat us with regard to Car... Carlotta, Sorelli, and little Germain. Why, my dear fellow, those two are mad with jealousy. To think they went to the expense of an advertisement in the Revue, Revue Theatrale. Have they nothing better to do? By the way, they seem to be greatly interested in that little Christine Day. You know as well as I do she has the reputation of being quite good. Reputations are easily obtained, replied Montsemi. Haven't I a reputation for knowing all about music, and I don't know one key from another? Mm, don't be afraid, you never had that reputation, Rich declared. And thereupon he ordered the artist to be shown in, who, for the last two hours, had been walking up and down outside the door which fame, behind which fame and fortune, or perhaps dismissal, awaited them. The whole day was spent in discussing, negotiating, signing, or cancelling contracts, and the two overworked managers went to bed early, and without so much as casting a glance at Box 5, to see whether Monsieur Debienne and Monsieur Poligny were enjoying the performance. Next morning the managers received a card of thanks from the ghosts. Dear Mr. Manager, thanks, charming evening. Day was exquisite. Courses went waking up. Rather... Courses want waking up. Carlotta, a splendid commonplace instrument. We'll raise you soon for the two hundred and forty thousand francs, sir. Two, two hundred, two, two hundred and thirty thousand four hundred and twenty-four francs seventy cents, to be correct. Messieurs Debian and Poligny have sent me the sixty, six thousand five hundred seventy-five francs and thirty cents, re representing the first ten days of my allowance for the current year. Their privileges finished on the evening of the tenth. Kind regards, Opera Ghost. On the other hand, there was a met there was a letter from Messieurs Debienne and Poligny. Gentlemen, we are much obliged for your kind thought of us, but you will easily understand that the prospect of again hearing Faust 
pleasant though it is to ex managers of the opera, could not make us forget that we have no right to occupy Box 5 on the Grand Tour, which is the exclusive property of him whom we spoke to you when we went through the memorandum book with you for the last time. See Clause 98, Final Paragraph. Accept, gentlemen, etc. No, those, those fellows are beginning to annoy me, shouted Richard, snatching up the letter. And that evening, Box 5 was sold. The next morning, Messieurs Richard and Montcharmain, on reaching their office, found an inspector's report relating to an incident that happened the night before in Box 5. I'll give the essential part of the report. I was obliged to call on a municipal... I was obliged to call in a municipal guard twice this evening to clear box five in the grand tier, once at the beginning and once in the middle of the second act. The occupants who arrived as the curtain rose in the second act created a regular scandal by their laughter and ridiculous observations. There were cries of hush all around them, and the whole house was beginning to protest when the box keeper came to fetch me. I entered the box and said what I thought necessary. The people didn't seem to me to be in their right mind. They made stupid remarks. I said that if the noise was repeated, I should be compelled to turn. I should be compelled to clear the box. The moment I left, I heard the laughing again with fresh protest from the house, and I returned with a municipal guard, who turned them out. They protested, still laughing, said they would not go unless they had their money back. At last, they became quiet, and I allowed them to enter the box again. The laughter at once recommenced, and this time I had them turned out indefinitely. "'Send for the inspector,' said Richard to his secretary, who had already re read the report and marked it with blue pencil. Monsieur Remy, the secretary, had foreseen the order and called the inspector at once. "'Tell us what happened,' said Richard bluntly. The inspector began to splutter and referred to the report. "'Well, well, well but what were those people laughing at?' said Montchermain. They must have been dining, sir, and seemed more inclined to lark about than to listen to good music. The moment they entered the box, they came out again and called the box-keeper, who asked them what they wanted. They said, look in the box, there's no one there, is there? No, said the woman. Well, said they, when we went in, we heard a voice saying that the box was taken. Monsieur Montchermain could not help smiling as he looked at Monsieur Richard, but Monsieur Richard did not smile. He himself had done too much in that way, in his time, not to recognize in the inspector's story the marks of one of those practical jokes which begin by amusing and end by enraging the victims. The inspector, to curry favor with Monsieur Marchamain, who was smiling, thought best to give a smile, too, a most unfortunate smile. Monsieur Richard glared at his subordinate, who thenceforth made, his, made it his business to display a face of utter consternation. However, however, when the people arrived, there was no one in the box, was there? No, sir, not a soul, not a soul, nor in the box on the right and nor in the box on the left. Not a soul, sir, I swear. The boxkeeper told it me often enough, which proves that it was all a joke. I agree, do you? You agree it's a joke and you think it funny, no doubt. I think it in very bad taste, sir. And what did the box keeper say? Oh, she just said it was the opera ghost. That's all she said. And the inspector grinned, but he soon found that he had made a mistake in grinning, for the words had no sooner left his mouth than Monsieur Richard, from gloomy, became furious. Send for the box keeper. Send for her. This minute, this moment, bring her in here to me and turn all those people out. The inspector tried to protest, but Richard closed his mouth with an angry order to hold his tongue. Then, when the wretched man's lips seemed shut forever, the manager commanded him open them once more. Who is this opera ghost? But the inspector was by this time incapable of speaking a word. He managed to convey, by a despairing gesture, that he knew nothing about it, or rather that he didn't wish to know. Have you ever seen him? Have you ever seen the opera ghost? The inspector, by means of a vigorous shake of the head, denied ever having seen the ghost in question. "'Very well,' said Richard coldly. The inspector's eyes started out of his head, as though to ask why the manager had uttered that ver ominous very well. 
because I'm going to settle the amount of anyone who's not seen him. As he seems to be everywhere, I can't have people telling me that they see him nowhere. I like people to work for me when I employ them. Having said this, Monsieur Richard paid no attention to the inspector, and discussed various matters of business with his acting manager, who had entered the room meanwhile. The inspector thought he could go, and was gently, oh so gently, sliding toward the door, when Monsieur Richard nailed the man to a floor with a thundering, STAY WHERE YOU ARE! Monsieur Remy had sent for the box-keeper to the Rue de Provence, close to the opera where she was engaged as a porteress, and she soon made her appearance. What's your name? Madame Geary. You know me well enough, sir. I'm the mother of little Geary and little Meg. What? This was said in so rough and solemn a tone that for a moment Monsieur Richard was impressed. He looked at Madame Geary in her faded shawl, worn shoes, and old taffeta dress and dingy bonnet. It was quite evident from the manager's attitude that he either did not know or could not remember having met Madame Geary, nor even little Geary, not even little Meg. But Madame Geary's pride was so great that the celebrated boxkeeper imagined that everybody knew her. I've never heard her. I've never heard of her, the manager declared. But that's no reason. Madame Geary, why shouldn't I ask you what happened last night to make you and the inspector call in a municipal guard? I was just wanting to see you, sir, and talk to you about it, so that you mightn't have the same unpleasantness as Monsieur de Bien and Poligny. And they wouldn't listen to me either at first, you see. I'm not asking you about all that. I'm asking you about what happened last night. Madame Geary turned purple with indignation. Never had she been spoken to like that. She rose as though to go, gathering up the folds of her skirt and waving the feathers of her dingy bonnet with dignity. But she changed her mind and sat down again, and said in a haughty voice, I'll tell you what happened. The ghost was annoyed again. Thereupon, as Monsieur Richard was on the point of bursting in, or out, rather, Monsieur Montcharmain interfered and conducted the interrogatory. Inter interrogatory? There we go. That's the word. Monsieur Montcharmain interfered and conducted the interrogatory, where whence it appeared that Madame Geary thought it quite natural that a voice should be heard to say that a box was taken when there was nobody in the box. She was unable to explain the phenomenon, which was not due to her, except by the intervention of the ghost. Nobody could see the ghost in his box, but everybody could hear him. She had often heard him, and they would believe her, for she always spoke the truth. They could ask Monsieur de Bien and Poligny, and anyone who knew her, and also Monsieur Isidore Sock, who had had a leg broken by the ghost. Indeed, said Montcharmain, interrupting her. Did the ghost break poor Isidore Sack's leg? Madame Geary opened her eyes with astonishment at such ignorance. However, she consented to enlighten the two poor in innocents. The thing had happened in Monsieur Debien and Poligny's time, also in Box 5, and also during a performance of Faust. Madame Geary coughed and cleared her throat. It sounded as though she were preparing to sing the whole of Gnaud's score and began. <clears throat> It was like this, sir. That night, Monsieur Meniere and his lady, the jewellers in the room Magador, were sitting in the front of the box with their great friend Monsieur Isidore Sac, sitting behind Madame Meniere. Mephistopheles was singing. Madame Geary burst into the song herself. Caterina, while you play, it's sleeping. And then Monsieur Meniere heard a voice in his right ear, his wife was on his left, saying, <laughs> Julie's not playing at sleeping. And his wife and his wife happened to be called Julie, so Monsieur Maniere turns to the right to see who was talking to him like that, and there was nobody there. He rubbed his ear and asked himself if he was dreaming. Then Mephistopheles, Mephistopheles went on with his serenade, but perhaps I'm boring you, gentlemen. No, no, go on. You are too good, gentlemen. Well, then Mephistopheles, Mephistopheles went on with his serenade, and, and at this Madame Geary burst into song again. Saint, unclose thy portals holy, and accord the bliss to a mortal bending, lowly of a pardon kiss. And then Monsieur Maniera again hears the voice in his right ear, saying this time, 
and Julie wouldn't mind according a kiss to his door. And then he turned, and then he turned round again, but this time to the left, and who do you think he sees? Isidore, who's taken his lady's hand, and was covering it with kisses through the little round place in the glove, like this gentleman, rapturously kissing the bit of palm left bare in the middle of her thread gloves. And then they had a lovely time between them. Bang! Bang! Monsieur Manier, who was big and strong like you, Monsieur Richard, gave two blows to Monsieur Isidore's sock, who was small and weak like Monsieur Montcharmain, saving his presence. There was a great uproar. People in the house shouted, That'll do. Stop them. He'll kill him. And then at last Monsieur Isidore's sock managed to run away. And then the ghost had not... Rather, did the ghost had not broken his leg? asked Monsieur Montcharmain, a little vexed that his figure had made so little impression on Madame Geary. Mm, he did break it for him, sir. Uh, he broke it for him on the grand staircase, which he ran down too fast, sir, and it'll be long before the poor gentleman will be able to go up it again. Will the ghost tell you what he said in Monsieur Manier's right ear? said Montcharmain, in a gravity that he thought exceedingly humorous. No, sir, it was Monsieur Manier himself, so... But you haven't spoken to the ghost, my good lady. Well, as I'm speaking to you now, my good sir, I've spoken to him. But when the ghost speaks to you, what does he say? Well, he tells me to bring him a footstool. And this time Richard was the one to burst out laughing, as Montcharmain and Remy did as well. Only the inspector, warned by experience, was careful not to laugh, while Madame Geary ventured to adopt an attitude that was positively threatening. Instead of laughing, you'd do better to do as Monsieur Poligny did, who found out for himself. Found out about what? asked Montcharmain, who had never been so much amused in his life. About the ghost, of course. Look here. She suddenly calmed herself, feeling that this was a solemn moment in her life. Look here. They were playing La Juive. Monsieur Poligny thought he would watch the performance from the ghost box. Well, when Leopold cries, let us fly, you know. And Eliezer stops them and says, Whither go ye? Well, Monsieur Poligny. I was watching him from the back of the next box, which was empty. Monsieur Poligny got up and walked out quite stiffly, like a statue, before I had time to ask him, Whither go ye? Like Eliezer. He was down the staircase, but without breaking his leg. Mm, still, that doesn't let us know how the opera ghost came to ask you for a footstool. Well, from that evening, no one tried to take the ghost's private box from him. The manager gave orders that he was to have it at each performance, and whenever he came, he asked me for a footstool. <laughs> a ghost asking for a footstool? Then you, this ghost of yours is a woman? things that didn't age well for 500 hours. I guess it's period accurate, whatever. No, the ghost is a man. How do you know? He has a man's voice. Oh, such a lovely man's voice. This is what happens. When he comes to the opera, it's usually the middle of the first act. He gives three little taps on the door of box five. The first time I heard those three little taps, when I knew there was no one in the box, you can think how puzzled I was. I opened the door, listened, and looked. There was nobody. And I heard a voice say, Madame Jules. My poor husband's name was Jules. A footstool, please. Saving your present, gentlemen, it made me feel all overish like. But the voice went on. Don't be frightened, Madame Jules. I'm the opera ghost. And the voice was so and the voice was so soft and kind that I hardly felt frightened. The voice was sitting in the corner chair on the right, in the front row. Was there any one in the box on the right of box five? No, box seven and box three, the one on the left. They were both empty. The curtain had only just gone up. And what did you do? Well, I brought the footstool. Of course, it wasn't for himself. He wanted it, but for his lady. But I never heard her nor saw her. <laughs> So the ghost is married now. The eyes of the two managers traveled from Madame Geary to the inspector, who was standing behind the boxkeeper and waving his arms to attract their attention. He tapped on his forehead with a distressful forefinger to convey his opinion that the widow Jules Geary was most certainly mad. 
a piece of pantomime which confirmed Monsieur Richard in his determination to get rid of the inspector who kept a lunatic in his service. Meanwhile, the worthy lady went on about her ghost, now painting his generosity. At the end of the performance, he always gives me two francs, sometimes five, sometimes even ten, when he's been many days without coming. Only since people have begun to annoy him again, he gives me nothing at all. Excuse me, my good woman, said Montcharmain, while Madame Giry tossed the feathers in her dingy hat at the persistent familiarity. Excuse me, how does the ghost manage to give you your two francs? Why, he leaves them on the little shelf in the box, of course. I find them with a program which I always give him. Some evening I find flowers in the box, a rose that must have dropped from his lady's bodice. For he brings the lady with him sometimes. One day they left a fan behind them. Oh, the ghost left a fan, did he? And what did you do with it? Well, I brought it back to the box the next night. Here the inspector's voice was raised. You've... Oh, <clears throat> you've broken the rules. I'll have to find you, Madame Geary. Hold your tongue, you fool! muttered Mer Furman Richard. You brought back the fan, and then... Well, then they took it away with them, sir. It was not there at the end of the performance, and in its place they left me a box of English sweets, which I'm very fond of, you see. That's one of the ghost's pretty thoughts. That will do, Madame Geary. You can go. And when Madame Geary had bowed herself out with the dignity that never deserted her, the manager told the inspector that they had decided to dispense with that old madwoman's services, and when he'd gone in his turn, they instructed the acting manager to make up the inspector's accounts. Left alone, the managers told each other of the idea which they had both had in mind, which was that they should look into that little matter of Box 5 themselves. And with that, folks, uh, we're going to look in the matter, into the matter of Box 5 next week in Chapter 5, The Enchanted Violin. Um, before I go, I need to uh, promote the Frozen Tundra Finds poll. Um, it really needs... Uh, it really needs, you know, people to take it because that data is incredibly viscerally useful for me in the process of you know continuing to produce frozen tundra finds so even if you don't really watch frozen tundra finds you can absolutely go you know vote it's i don't mind if you haven't seen any of the videos just go give it a give it a vote um there for the recording folks uh the link should be in the description uh for the people who are live i just put it in the chat but anyway, uh, that's all from me this evening. This has been Paper Cuts, and I hope it didn't sting.